Dear students, this is another installment of the lecture on architecture and programming models for GPUs and coprocessors. We're currently talking about ray tracing and we're talking about bounding volume hierarchies. And we want to understand how to construct high quality bounding volume hierarchies. And then later we also want to understand how to do this really fast. Yeah, in the last session we talked about BVH construction and we learned about the top-down construction heuristic and that there are so-called uh, split plane heuristics that help us identify potential uh, split candidates where we uh, perform splits in order to further subdivide the given domain. And let us just gain a bit of more intuition how that actually works. Say for instance we were given this very simple scene here that is comprised of four triangles like those four triangles here. And we're asked to build a, a binary BVH, a BVH of AABBs. So we're going to end up with bounding volumes that are just axis aligned boxes. And we're asked to uh, perform top down construction. So the very first thing that we do in all cases is um, we just uh, construct the uh, bounding volume, so the axis aligned bounding box around all the triangles that are seen. So this is where we start with. And then we have our very first decision to make, and the, this decision we have to make with all the uh, different construction schemes. And the question is really along which axis we split. Like, and there are a bunch of different ways to decide that. But what usually uh, what people do is like a very simple, simple heuristic. Like, for instance, just pick the axis where the bounding box has this longest side. Yeah. And based on that heuristic, we would just pick a split along the vertical axis, right? So we would try and split the uh, plane along the vertical axis, which in our case also makes sense just because of the geometrical arrangement of the of the primitives in the scene. So in very, very uh, simple uh, heuristics to determine a split candidate could just look like something like this, like where we just perform middle split. Like we basically just find the, like the midpoint of the uh, longest side that we're splitting along. And we will just find the midpoint and then construct a plane through that. And then we just put everything that was left uh, to the to the uh, plane, we put it to the left, and everything that's right to the plane, we partition it to the right. And then in certain cases, we would have just to have to make a decision. Like, we're not constructing a KD tree here, where we would put this triangle into both the left and to the right half space. But here we just have to make a decision. So we'll then uh, later construct bounding boxes, and it actually uh, doesn't matter if those bounding boxes straddle the, sp the split plane, right? So that doesn't even matter. So the split plane is really just for orientation so that we find out where, like roundabout, to place that split. And then we will construct uh, bounding boxes for those uh, child nodes that we just computed, and they would end up being something like that, right? Like you can see that the bounding box would straddle the original split plane a bit, but it's just fine because the um, split plane was just there in order to guide our, our bounding box construction. Yeah, and then we would um, do this recursively as our top-down heuristic is a recursive algorithm. And we would maybe split again or we would use um, some type of termination criterion. Like, like this can actually be very simple criteria. Like for instance with the middle split we might decide that we just stop when we uh, found, when we might just stop and create a leave node when the current node contains like fewer than uh, two triangles for instance. In our case, we would maybe split split once more, and we would just do that until uh, the uh, termination criterion is reached. So there are other very uh, simple heuristics out there, like for instance the median split heuristic, which would would just try and partition the same number of triangles to either the left and to the right side. And like the uh, in the example here, I'm always splitting along the vertical axis, but uh, quite obviously. This is, in general, not the case, right? In general, I would just pick the axis that the heuristic tells me to pick. So and a more educated decision can be made with what is called the surface area heuristic. And the surface area heuristic is like the agreed upon uh, heuristic uh, that people use to construct high quality BVH or KD trees nowadays. And the surface area heuristic would basically work as follows. Like we would be given a uh, a split plane candidate, like uh, like no matter how we uh, how we obtain that split candidate, but say we are just given this uh, split plane, and then we would compute the uh, surface area heuristic costs and the uh, terms that uh, go into uh, that uh, cost function are, like on the one hand we have to consider the bounding volume to the left and to the right, 
uh, like in our case, those bounding volumes, they are just um, access aligned bounding boxes. But in general, um, like with the BVH, we can have any type of bounding volume. And so we would consider the bounding volume to the left and to the right. Like in the bounding volume to the left here would be empty. And the bounding volume to the right would be the, would in our case, just be the access aligned bounding box around the uh, four triangles. So we would be given that. And we also know the number of triangles to the left and to the right of those split plane, or if we don't know it, we would have to count it. And uh, we also know uh, like the bounding volume of the of the node itself, uh, like um, because this is also important. And um, with that information, we will construct the surface area cost function. And the surface area cost function would basically compute what the costs would be um, if we were to make uh, to to perform a split. And what we therefore consider is, on the one hand, the ratio of the bounding volume that we uh, construct, like the like we're always considering the surface area of those bounding volumes. So we're computing the surface area of that bounding volume to the left, and that to the right. And that ratio basically tells us the likelihood that this bounding volume um, could be hit by a, by a by an arbitrary ray that traverses the scene from one end to the other end, like a, a ray that won't be interrupted by uh, any any uh, interactions, like any surface interactions, what would the likelihood be of uh, hitting the, uh, the node, the bounding volume? And uh, we would compute that ratio for the left and for the right split plane, and we would multiply that um, by the number of primitives that we would, uh, that we would uh, have in the left and in the, in the right node. And then there are like um, two user uh, supplied parameters, and the uh, CI parameter basically tells us um, how we would assess the costs uh, for performing a ray primitive or a ray triangle intersection. And the other cost parameter would tell us um, how we would assess the costs for performing a traversal through the, th uh, through the tree, uh, like what the uh, down traversal would cost. So and with uh, that cost function, we um, would just evaluate that cost function for a bunch of split planes. And now there are like um, different strategies how we can obtain those split planes. Like once again, we just we would just choose an axis, right? Like you would choose one of the axes, and we'll again uh, choose the axis with the longest side. And one strategy would just be to sweep, like continuously sweep from the left to the right, right? Like we would start with the split plane here. Like um, say this is the first split. First split plane that our continuous sweep function gives us, like we're, we're of course doing doing that, like we would sweep with some type of like floating point epsilon, and then we would just sweep and would move the uh, plane just um, from the left to the right, and then we would test every potential candidate. And as you can see, like there's a bunch of planes that would have just the very same uh, SAH cost function, right? Like like no matter where I place the split plane here inside that triangle, uh, you would have the uh, exact cost function, it of course doesn't make much sense. And therefore, um, people optimize this a bit by just aligning the uh, split planes with uh, one of the vertices of the triangle, for example. Uh, like what people could, like the like a very simple optimization here. Well, it's really not an optimization, but we, we would actually consider all the candidates uh, that make sense to consider, um, no matter if we do this continuous sweep thing or if we directly jump to the triangle vertices, right? Um, so like we could optimize this a bit, but uh, this would be one strategy in order to compute uh, split plane candidates. And then in the end, when we tested all potential split plane candidates, um, we would just pick the plane with the lowest cost, and then we would continue the recursion. So and here it is again, our greedy heuristic for top-down BVH tree construction using the surface area heuristic. And why is this heuristic greedy? Yeah, well. Because when we um, determine a split candidate and then we eventually we pick a split candidate, we only do this on one level, right? We're never like considering splits that are on lower lower levels, but we are, on, are only considering splits that are on the current level. And therefore, uh, we have this greedy heuristic where we like determine split planes somehow using sweeping, for instance, and then we determine the SAH costs and compute two uh, new nodes. And those new nodes are then uh, recursively split again and again until we uh, meet some type of a uh, type of termination criterion. And we already learned about the sweeping approach, where we uh, determine split plane candidates by just um, picking one of the sides of the bounding box, like arbitrarily, like the longest side, for instance. And then we just move planes from the left to the right, right? Um, then uh, when we perform sweeping, like. Uh, 
we we eventually will pick a split plane candidate, and then the next thing that we have to do is uh, we have to take all the primitives that are to the, to the left and to the right, and we have to partition them into the subnodes, right? And so that we can later continue the recursion. And in order to do so, uh, people usually use very simple O of n uh, partition algorithms. Like um, if you recall what people do for quicksort, like if you um, think back to computer science one and uh, recall how quicksort is implemented, like there were very simple in-place uh, partition algorithms that uh, could be that, that were used. And we would use a very similar algorithm actually in order to partition the trees to the left and to the right. Like how exactly that works, um, how exactly we partition isn't so important for us here. Um, apart from the fact that it is relatively costly, like it is um, linear in the number of primitives. Um, that of course means the costs that we're having for the construction, which will translate into construction performance and which uh, will this uh, impact yeah, the, um, the time it takes to rebuild a scene in case like when we're having a dynamic geometry or so. And uh, this is very much uh, dominated by the upper levels of the tree, right? When we construct the upper levels of the tree, we have um, many triangles. Like on the upper level, we have the full set of triangles. Like when we're given a 3D model that consists of a million triangles, we have to partition uh, all of those to the left and to the right. And then we, when we perform the next split, we're like on average, like, like it's kind of likely that we already halved the problem size. So on each individual tree level, we only have to partition only half the number of triangles, like on average. So that means that the costs for partitioning are relatively high on the, on the upper levels of the tree and are relatively low when we um, reach the leaf nodes of the tree. And the same observation uh, can also be made for the sweeping uh, approach. Like on the upper level, like when we, for instance, use this um, continuous sweeping, like this very naive approach, this is uh, just limited by the size of the of the bounding box. Uh, like we are picking the longest side, and the longest side on the upper level of the tree will be longer uh, than the longest side for a leaf node. Usually, significantly longer. And even if we do this alignment thing, where we just say we place split planes through one of the triangle's vertices, or maybe through all of the vertices, then we are bounded by the number of triangles in the node that we are trying to split, right? And on the uh, upper, like when we're splitting the root, the root node, then we have many more triangles than when we're splitting a leaf. And therefore, um, there are approaches out there that um, actually discretize the domain of the node that we're splitting, like discretizing it into a fixed number of bins. And then the idea is uh, that you, that you um, discretize the node into bins and test only split plane candidates that are at the bin boundaries. And how that works uh, can be shown in a very simple example. Like this here would be our um, sweeping algorithm. And in order to test every uh, possible split plane candidate, we would just like uh, sweep that plane from the left to the right and then compute all the bounding boxes and compute the costs, right? And this would just be uh, limited by the number of triangles. Like here we have four triangles, but if we had a million triangles, then we had to like uh, at least test um, candidate planes that are aligned to each of the uh, triangle vertices uh, and so on. And in order to improve this a bit, people use so-called binning. That is, they uh, take the domain of the node that we're currently splitting and discretizing that into bins. And, and then only test candidate planes that are on the bin boundaries and construct potential child nodes from that. And like the idea here is really that no matter where in the hierarchy you are, you use the same number of bins, right? Like when you're on the, uh, on the root node and have one million triangles to partition, you use four bins. And when you're on a, on a leave node and only have like 10 or like a handful of triangles to partition, you also use uh, four bins. And that of course reduces the complexity quite a bit. And binning actually has been quite popular with the community. Like, like there were, uh, were papers from a couple of years ago, and they show that binning actually doesn't have much an influence on tree quality. Like, this actually makes kind of sense. Well, because if you think, like, like when you're on the upper level and, and trying to compute split plane candidates, then it maybe doesn't matter so much if you partition like 500,000 triangles to the left and 500,000 triangles to the right, or if you partition like 
499,995 triangles to the left and 500,005 triangles to the right, right? Like assuming that the triangles are relatively evenly sized so that they don't differ very much in size, then this doesn't that's probably not make so much of a, much of a difference because the uh, two split planes that we consider might actually be very similar. And like like we we might still pick the one with the better costs, but uh, then we also have to um, remember that we're using a greedy heuristic. Like we could actually run into some uh, local optimum that is actually not the global optimum. So that decision is is anyway still kind of arbitrary which plane we pick. But uh, this is to illustrate that on the upper levels it's probably not so important which planes we pick, and and on the lower level it's probably more important because like. When we're about to partition a node that only contains like a handful of triangles, then it m might make a huge difference if we um, put one triangle to the left, four triangles to the right, or if we, um, we uh, perform a different split. So binning has shown to be quite effective and produce uh, trees that are um, very high quality, like even compared to the uh, sweeping approaches that are much more compute intensive actually. So few marks regarding the surface area heuristic, like the greedy heuristic, and um, we we already discussed that uh, top-down construction employs a greedy heuristic, and like, what people alternatively do is um, they use so-called um, like like they 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 try to refine those trees using tree rotations, like where you basically pick a sub node like like a a, a sub tree and then um, rotate nodes inside that tree, aiming to improve the uh, global surface area heuristic. Um, with that you can like further reduce the surface area surface area costs um, on a global scale but that of course also comes at higher construction costs. Another thing that's important to say is that the um, surface area heuristic is uh, actually the state of the art. Like um, whenever you use a state of the art ray tracing library and use uh, one of the high quality builders, like the ray tracing libraries usually provide uh, different types of builders depending on uh, what you're optimizing for. So you can usually uh, choose, but if you choose a high quality builder, then you're usually uh, using a uh, variant of the algorithm that I just showed you. Like the uh, algorithm is uh, focused on binary BVH construction, and uh, this is actually not the uh, state of the art nowadays. Like depending on the architecture that you are using, you're likely to not build binary BVHs there. But what you're usually using is a BVH that is that was optimized using the SAH. You might remember that I earlier mentioned very briefly that top-down construction is very popular, but is mostly popular popular on CPUs, and uh, that has a reason. And the reason basically being that top-down construction exposes very little parallelism. Like, when we're uh, constructing our hierarchy top-down, the uh, most obvious way to parallelize this is um, performing splits in parallel, right? Like, we're, um, when we're at the, at the root node, um, we only have one node that we can split. Huh? Um, but, when we, but as soon as the root node is split, um, we can perform uh, splits uh, for two nodes in parallel, right? And then uh, when we go down the tree, um, we can process even more uh, splits in parallel. And the problem here is really that, like for a CPU, um, this might be sufficient parallelism. Like in a sense, like imagine we have like four processors, and in the first time step, we just don't don't have enough work for the for all the processors uh, to uh, to 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 do something useful. So here the First processor would do the actual work, and the uh, other three processors uh, of our like quad core processor uh, would idle. And then when we go down the hierarchy, uh, we get more and more work to do. Uh, like in the on the uh, in the second time step on the second level of the construction algorithm, we would already use two processors, and on the third level we would we would use uh, four processors. But the problem is really that. Um, like, like we have to traverse the tree to a certain depth until we actually have enough work so that all the processors are occupied. And like on a four core processor or on an eight or a 60 co 16 core processor, this uh, might be okay. Like there are actually more clever strategies than the one that I'm outlining here to parallelize. Like people use priority queues and stuff like this. Um, and you, you can also like, like there are other there are other ways to parallelize like for instance the partition step could be I could, I could imagine that you parallelize the partition step 
But nevertheless, the top-down BVH uh, construction uh, exposes very little parallelism up until the uh, tree is uh, built up to a certain level. And that is actually very bad for GPUs, where you have like uh, thousands of threads that you have to give some work to do, like so that they can uh, can so can efficiently work in parallel. Like when you're, we'll, when we we will uh, learn much more about GPUs later and how they operate. But in particular, when a GPU doesn't uh, doesn't have enough work to do, so that uh, part of the pipeline is idle. And it's actually very bad. Then it is very hard to make good use of the uh, of the resource GPU, and therefore top-down construction algorithms are quite popular on uh, CPUs, but they are more or less invisible on GPUs. Like uh, you can work around uh, this to some extent, but the algorithms that come to use that run on uh, GPUs are usually not top-down. Like they are usually we'll talk about a, a uh, we will talk about bottom-up construction schemes and on GPUs you usually use some sort of bottom-up construction scheme when you want to build uh, BVHs. Bottom-up construction makes things more complicated actually. Like in general it's harder to build a high quality tree um, with a with a, a bottom-up traversal algorithm. Like there are actually very efficient ones out there but it's actually much harder to do and for those reasons we will now discuss uh, alternatives to the uh, top-down approach that we just discussed which on a CPU would be perfectly fine. And as soon as we're on a many core architecture with many cores that need to perform work simultaneously and otherwise will we will not be making good use of the ship, they are um, more or less infeasible and therefore we'll now have a look into bottom-up construction of BVHs. And I want to keep our discussion of the bottom-up construction schemes relatively short. So I'm just going to sketch the basic principle here uh, like the principle that is underlying many of those bottom-up construction algorithms that have very high uh, construction performance. Um, for in under, order to understand the basic idea of many very popular bottom-up construction schemes, we should consider certain properties of the Morton codes, the space-filling curves that we discussed during one of the exercises. Like um, those were the um, Morton codes that we discussed and we remember that we were able to construct those Morton codes using an integer representation of their x, y, and uh, in 3D of their z coordinates, and then performing the so-called in shuffle operation that would give us the uh, so-called Morton codes. And there's actually a certain properties uh, to those Morton codes in, the, in that uh, the Morton codes inherently form a hierarchy. And for that, we just consider subgroups of Morton codes, and we can observe that there is a natural a split through that subgroup and that it is possible to identify this um, split based on the um, most significant bits of the Morton codes that represent the subgroup. Like as an example, this subgroup here um, can be uh, fully uh, indexed with Morton codes uh, using four bits, right? So um, that is the uh, um, group is representable with four bits and if we uh, check the in Morton codes of the of the group, then we find out that uh, in this subgroup um, there is a potential split, like a an inherent hierarchical split, where the most significant bits. So um, when, we go, when we come from the left here, where the most significant bits uh, differ. So the same is true, like for for instance, if we were to uh, consider this subgroup down here, right? Like if we have only that uh, bottommost subgroup here. And we inspect the um, most significant bits, like the subgroup is representable using three bits. And if we just uh, check the um, most significant bits of those three bits of the subgroup, um, then we find that there is a potential split just where the most significant bits differ. Yeah? Right? As we here, we're having a zero here and a one here, um, that means we can split along this axis here and uh, at this very position. And the very same thing is true for this, this subgroup too. Right? So we can just identify um, the position where to split. We can identify that position by inspecting the most significant bits and uh, where the most significant uh, bits differ in regards to the number of bits that we need to represent the subgroup, we can perform a split. As a matter of fact, uh, this is the, the split that this implies is actually a middle split. And like earlier, we learned qu quite a bit about um, different types of splits and that we would like to prefer uh, splits that were uh, constructed using SAH, 
And so this is uh, definitely a, an inferior uh, type of splitting the primitives, of, of splitting them up into uh, different groups and of creating a hierarchy. But it is, it is very powerful in that it allows us to build uh, hierarchies from the bottom up. Like a typical construction scheme would go kind of as follows. We would just uh, take all the triangles in the scene, right? And then we would um, assign them uh, 3D Morton codes. Like, um, like they were basically representable with 30 bits. That is, we would store one integer per triangle. And that basically means we now have, an, have a... Um, we, we, we've basically now organized our triangles on a, on a uniform grid. Like we need to take one representative point of those triangles like the triangles actually have uh, our like our entities in space, and it is not possible to to generally order them. So we have uh, to define how we order those triangles, how we how we represent the order of those triangles, and we do this um, like arbitrarily um, based on computing an AABB for the triangle, and then uh, computing the triangle centroids, and those centroids uh, will uh, define the order of the triangles, and then we would just uh, take the centroids and uh, sort them using a O of N uh, sorting algorithm. Uh, like um, we're sorting bit fields here, bit codes, and so we can basically just sort them using uh, uh, in the same way that we would sort zip codes. Uh, so with a radix sort with an O of N sorting algorithm. And then we would use this Morton order um, organization of our triangles, we would use it to construct a hierarchy. And this would basically be done by spawning a, like a GPU thread per centroid, per Morton code, and then identifying for each node, for each centroid that we organized using the Morton codes, we would just find out in which group it belongs. And by finding out in which group it belongs, we can um, construct hierarchies. And like the algorithm that I very briefly sketched here is the so-called LBVH algorithm, the uh, linear BVH algorithm. And what we that, like the trees that we obtain with linear BBH are actually inferior, like in comparison to SAH. And therefore, there's just a bunch of other algorithms that is based on the LBVH algorithm. So a very popular approach is, for instance, to build top-level level BBHs and use LBVH only for the top level, so that we start out with uh, some parallelism and then uh, on the leave nodes uh, build something that is called a treelet, which essentially would be like a, an SAH constructed uh, BVH tree. So in general, top-down construction is relatively slow and has uh, less potential for parallelization on the upper levels. Bottom-up construction in general is uh, faster and exposes uh, much more parallelism, but on the other hand has the disadvantage that uh, the trees that we construct usually have lower quality. And therefore, the most popular approaches nowadays are hybrid approaches when it comes to construction on GPUs and on many core architectures. And those approaches, they kind of balance uh, construction and traversal costs. And just to give you some pointers, like um, if you want to find out what the uh, state of the art currently does, like I, in this short time, could only sketch the most basic principles. But what the state of the art does is, uh, for instance, like uh, state-of-the-art methods are, for instance, the compressed white BBHs by NVIDIA, where chances are that those are also the BBHs that are used by Optics and by the RT-Core hardware. And there's also a nice paper that's a couple of years old now. This is uh, called the Bonsai BBH, uh, which is basically a tree-led approach. The high-level linear bounding volume hierarchies, they are an extension to the LBVH algorithm. The TR and ATR BBH algorithms are also tree-led algorithms. So if you follow those pointers, uh, you'll find a couple of research papers, and then uh, you, you can gain a much more thorough understanding of how those construction algorithms work. And for us, it's important that we have this understanding that there are bottom-up and top-down construction schemes. Bottom-up, in general, is uh, faster in regards to construction, but it is harder to incorporate like an SAH split into those hierarchy construction algorithms. Like with SAH basically be being the gold standard when it comes to tree quality, and uh, this is actually kind of hard to incorporate in a bottom-up construction scheme. Like there are hybrid approaches that allow for that, 
but in general it's kind of hard and on the other hand we have a uh, top down with uh, sweep construction and uh, the surface area heuristic which is kind of the gold standard but um, which results in relatively high construction costs and also relatively little parallelism in particular on the upper levels of the tree construction algorithm. So on the very last topic that I want to touch upon that has to do with ray tracing is uh, so-called real-time ray tracing. Like I uh, really want to discuss this uh, only very briefly because um, actually it's like in the light of uh, vendors like Nvidia shipping ray tracing hardware nowadays, it's actually a bit of an arcane discussion. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it just still has a couple of interesting aspects that in my opinion are interesting to discuss and where we can learn a bit about software optimization and uh, therefore, we should uh, like devote a couple of minutes to discuss what is important, like when you want to perform real-time ray tracing on a CPU or in a GPU, for instance. Like in, in particular, as for the better part of the last 20 years, uh, real-time ray tracers are actually software programs, like they didn't uh, make use of any hardware acceleration. And the first research groups uh, that, that uh, worked on real-time ray tracers, they did that in the early 2000s. And like there was a bunch of very notable groups, one for instance from Saarbrücken University here in Germany, and they uh, used uh, the CPUs to begin with. And during that time, like uh, vendors like Intel or uh, AMD, they started uh, shipping CPUs that had uh, multiple cores and that had uh, had SIMB vector units. Like uh, in that time, vector extensions like MMX and SSE became quite popular. Like with uh, MMX was like the uh, very first uh, vector extension that was out there and that was advertised as the multimedia extensions and uh, basically were 64-bit wide SIMD vectors. And then later were superseded by SSE, which uh, provided 128-bit uh, uh, SIMD and which is actually still around. Like the SSE instruction set is still available on uh, on our contemporary CPUs, and those research groups actually wrote like very highly optimized software programs. Like they were um, really, really hand tuned, and um, like and with that, they were actually quite a bit faster than solutions like what was uh, what were typical ray tracers did in those days. Like for instance, Pathray, etc. So and in particular, like ray tracers at that time, they adopted usually adopted an object oriented design. Like some some ray traces were actually written in C, um, but nevertheless there are also, there are different mechanics that can be used to basically achieve the same thing only with uh, different language constructs. And the idea is basically that you introduce flexibility into the uh, into the ray tracer by providing abstract based classes, right? Like for instance, um, in order to support more than one primitive, you would provide a an abstract based class primitive. And the um, primitive class would have a certain interface, like you could intersect a ray with the primitive, and you could, for instance, ask it for a normal vector. Like this is, of course, a very a very simplified version of such an interface. Like you, like the interface would be be a bit more complicated, but not much more complicated. And then you would have your derived classes that would implement that interface. And the same would be true, like for materials, and uh, for different light source types. Um, maybe uh, for like like maybe for textures etc. Like uh, the design basically would be centered around uh, something that we would call late binding, right? Like in such a design, the compiler really doesn't know what's going on. Like as a matter of fact, like you if your ray tracer exposed this interface through a library, then you could even write a plugin that linked against that library and used the interface, and so the compiler would really never know what's going on and what the intersect call does. Like and for instance, imagine we have a a BVH traversal routine. So in the innermost loop of your ray tracer, the BVH traversal would call intersect with the with the uh, triangle primitive or whatever primitive you are you have. And in the innermost loop, you would have those virtual function calls. And those virtual function calls, they have uh, several issues. And on the one hand, you have uh, late binding, and therefore the compilers cannot optimize. So in particular, when you write a real-time ray tracer, what you want to do is you want to make use of inlining. That is, um, you have lots of small functions, like for instance, material shading functions, like the Lambertian shader. It's usually like a, a one-liner, like a single dot product. And it's a good idea when you can, if you can inline all that. And it's a really bad idea when you have like um, lots of function call overhead. So what that should illustrate is that real-time ray tracers are like they're really hand-optimized programs 
But as a matter of fact, um, with those hand optimizations, a um, real-time ray tracers can run to can, can run an order of magnitude or even faster uh, than a uh, an equivalent object-oriented code. Like the late binding problem is one thing. Like the compiler doesn't know what the intersect function does and therefore cannot uh, inline the intersect function. Right, and instead this uh, causes function call overhead. And this is actually quite severe. Like uh, if you measure that, um, you'll find out that it really hurts. And then on the other hand, like those uh, polymorphic interfaces, they actually cause uh, branching. And branching is also something that you want to avoid for several reasons. Like branching is, is bad for caches, like for instance for the instruction cache, um, where you don't really know which instructions to, uh, to execute next. And the same is true for data, like for the data caches. So you really want to avoid uh, branching in innermost loops. Like and from that, like when you have a if a library like for instance Embry nowadays, uh, those libraries they usually support um, two types of primitives and they usually provide different code paths for that. Like the first primitive would just be a triangle, and the second primitive would be a like a user primitive. And like like when you um, have your BVH, um, you would only have a BVH of only one of those types, right? And the uh, user primitive usually would be a bit slower and would have like would, would support some type of callback that could be called um, that the user provides. And the uh, triangle primitive would be used to basically model the fast path. So real-time ray, tra ray tracers they usually try to el eliminate branches and they usually make uh, use of early binding optimizations uh, so that the compiler can holistically optimize the ray tracing program. So, and then um, ray tracers, like, I mean, obviously, uh, ray tracers um, make use of um, parallelism and of multi core, and that kind of makes sense. Like, we already discussed earlier that you would, that you would usually um, parallelize uh, over, the, like, over the screen, like over the pixels of the screen. And this is actually a scheme that you uh, would usually adopt in your ray tracing programs. Like, if you, for instance, have an optimized ray, tracer, ray tracing library like Embry, then this part of the ray tracer was, would usually fall to the user. So the user would like uh, schedule a bunch of threads, generate rays, and all that falls to the user. And the ray tracing library would basically only help you with intersecting rays versus triangles or rays versus user primitives. So this is most usually mostly hidden by the ray tracing libraries. But like for instance, if you have if you, if you consider optics, where optics itself handles the the parallelism. You usually have a parallelism over the over the rays that originate from the camera, like very similar to what we discussed before, and that means that the only means left to make use of uh, of uh, parallelism is ZIMD, and there are actually two different uh, strategies to make use of ZIMD in real time ray tracers, uh, like on CPUs. And that kind of depends on uh, which ray tracing algorithm you use. Like when you use an algorithm like the primary ray casting algorithm that we discussed before, then you usually have something like uh, like ray packets. And so ray packets would basically work as follows. And here's the basic principle behind packet ray tracing. And the idea is just that say um, you have a ray tracer, and the ray tracer just uh, sends a bunch of uh, camera rays into the scene. And your camera rays are relatively coherent, uh, like they start at the same origin and go into about the same direction. And in this case, your rays are actually quite likely that they will hit the same objects. Uh, like the, the, two ob the two rays here, the two first rays, will actually hit the same object. And like when uh, you would, do, would implement that in a, uh, in, a, in a single ray fashion, like where you uh, trace single rays through the scene, what you would do is uh, you would trace your ray and then you would pull your geometry from memory and would intersect the ray against the geometry. And then you would shade the geometry, you would maybe pull uh, material functions from that and then you would probably evict the primitive, like in all likelihood, the primitive would no longer be in any cache uh, but would be evicted because in the meantime you've used uh, other resources than that. And then you would uh, trace your second ray and the uh, second ray would uh, cause your program to pull the primitive from memory again. And therefore what people do is um, they uh, combine rays that are coherent, uh, they combine them into packets, and then instead of uh, intersecting single rays with the primitives, um, intersect the whole packets with the primitive. Like it's 
is uh, basically a ray of uh, consisting of n rays that you intersect with a single primitive, and therefore you would it would only um, pull the primitive from memory once. So that is uh, uh, this is actually a um, memory access optimization. But you also make a use of SIMD registers because you would um, like model the whole code path in SIMD, like with an SSE vector, for instance. And then you would have like a small tile of pixels that you uh, would handle concurrently within a single SIMD line. And of course, it's uh, it's not a very good idea to switch between the different execution modes. So when you once once when you decided to go with a SIMD packet model, then you usually stick with this. Like there are hybrid approaches out there, but um, you would usually just uh, stick with this and keep using packets. Like uh, you either have a single ray ray tracer, or you would have a packet ray tracer. And uh, hybrid approaches actually pretty seldom. Like on most platforms, they are actually not worthwhile. And then like the problem with this is actually. Like, I mean, for those very um, coherent workloads that we just saw, like in the case like where we, for instance, implement the primary ray casting algorithm with ZIMD, we can see like astonishing speedups actually by using that principle. And the problem really is that when your rays start to diverge, like due to reflection, then uh, this uh, packet approach actually becomes quite ineffective. Like um, the more coherent your workload actually is, the more you, you can potentially benefit from using packets. And for uh, highly incoherent workloads, like for instance, uh, workloads from a path tracer or so, your benefits will be uh, relatively low. And as a matter of fact, you will uh, actually introduce some overhead. So chances are that your packets actually in a path tracer actually were, will perform worse uh, than uh, without using packets. And like the more coherent your workload is, the higher is the probability that you might actually uh, benefit from using packets. Like for instance, if you have a ray tracer that only uh, evaluates primary visibility and only evaluates delta phenomena, like perfect mirrors and point light shadows, then uh, chances are that you will benefit from using packets. And when you have like a highly incoherent ray tracer, like for instance, a path tracer, then divergence uh, will cause performance to go, do go down quite a bit and uh, you'll only introduce overhead by using packets. And for those reasons, many modern libraries nowadays actually employ a different strategy to make uh, use of ZIMD. Because uh, one thing's for certain, you and when you're in the CPU, you, you really want to make use of ZIMD. Like when you write a real-time ray tracer, then you really want to make use of ZIMD. Uh, otherwise, you will just not make full use of the capabilities of the CPU. And the other strategy that people use is that they, um, instead of uh, traversing packets, uh, they traverse single rays, but instead um, use uh, bounding volume hierarchies that uh, store end child nodes per inner node. Like for instance, if your ZIMD width is four, they would just store four child nodes per inner BVH node, making this an four array BVH, like a BVH four is what people call this. And then uh, they would intersect that single ray against four BVH nodes at once in a ZIMD fashion. And then at the leaf nodes, they would like store four triangles or a multiple of four triangles. And then um, instead of, of intersecting single rays against single triangles or a packet against a single triangle, they would instead intersect a single ray against four triangles at once. And that strategy is actually that strategy actually lends itself um, much better to um, divergence in the ray workload because this is completely independent of uh, how the rays uh, traverse through the scene, right? No matter how the, the, the rays traverse through the scene, they will still uh, go through the BVH and uh, this uh, strategy um, basically assumes that the rays are completely independent. That's actually pretty helpful. That's a, this is uh, a strategy like when you have a very coherent workload, then you usually see better performance from the packet approach. But when your workload is quite divergent, quite incoherent, uh, then it's a very good idea to use the uh, second strategy actually. Like there exist hybrid strategies um, that use both packets and multi-BVHs, what they are called, but those uh, strategies are mostly like for um, for uh, certain architectures, like for instance the Xeon Phi architecture was shown to benefit a bit from such a hybrid approach because uh, the Xeon Phi architecture had a very wide uh, ZIMD unit, like a 512 512-bit uh, ZIMD unit, where you would have to trace like 16 rays at once, 
uh, if you wanted to use packets, which is quite a bit, and the in all likelihood you would see a divergence from there pretty soon, only from the uh, relatively high ZIMD width. And on the other hand, BVH nodes with a branching factor of 16 also aren't very practical. So in those scenarios, hybrid strategies might make sense. But in general, people would uh, pick either of the two strategies. And nowadays, uh, strategy two, where you try a single race to the BVH, um, are provenly very flexible. So um, this brief discussion of real-time ray tracing, which is basically just an overview, um, shall close our discussion of ray tracing for now. Like we will, at the a lecture, once or twice, talk about ray tracing again. But for the time being, this closes our discussion on ray tracing. So on the very last strictly computer graphics related topic that I want to discuss uh, in this lecture is parallel rendering. And I want to par uh, discuss parallelism on different levels. Like, for instance, when we uh, discuss uh, GPUs, we will find that GPUs in and of themselves are highly parallel machines. So we're uh, going to discuss what type of parallelism there is in GPUs. We will also have a bit of a discussion, like we already discussed how one would parallelize a ray tracer, like um, with a, a parallelization over all the tiles. And we're going to look a little bit deeper into uh, how one would parallelize a typical ray tracing problem. And another aspect that I want to discuss is uh, distributed memory. Like, we'll discuss um, distributed memory in a very general way, because um, distributed memory manifests in situations where you wouldn't assume that it uh, would uh, manifest. Like, for instance, uh, when we have a GPU, we will find that due to the architecture of the GPU, they can actually be considered a small distributed memory systems. Like, uh, we will learn about that, but we will also learn about distributed memory um, parallel rendering in a context where you, uh, say, have a uh, bunch of processing nodes, and those processing nodes uh, work together on a, a single uh, visualization task or in a single rendering task. So very generally, um, I want to discuss distributed memory in a fashion where each processor like uh, holds like a bit of the data that is uh, relevant to the visualization problem. And there are several distinctions that can be made in that either uh, you have a data, a, a processor that is um, just a responsible like for a certain part of the geometry, or you can have processes that are um, like have all the data um, for a certain part of the image. Like like this is uh, like a, a, a general distinction that you make when it comes to uh, data parallel rendering, and um, we will uh, discuss this in a fashion like where we discuss uh, typical algorithms that one would use for visualization on a supercomputer. Uh, like for instance where you have a, a simulation and the simulation like uh, was run on a supercomputer and now the simulation result is distributed on the various nodes of the supercomputer. And we're now also going to use the uh, cluster for, for, for visualization. And there the most important objective is usually to reduce the uh, overhead from network communication. And we're going to discuss several approaches, like the usual approaches, as I already said, are just that you either distribute uh, the geometry or that you distribute uh, images over the network. Like you have to perform some type of communication and then you have to um, optimize for your specific data. Like for instance, the question is if, uh, what, if you are like, for instance, if you have an animation that you're rendering or if you are rendering multiple time steps, or if you are rendering like a uh, like a camera animation, and then there's also special handling for data. Like for instance, if the data is sparse or if the data is uh, dense, like depending on what the topology of the data is, there are different algorithms that people might use for that. And the uh, very first thing that I want to discuss is the taxonomy by Molnar. And Molnar basically posed parallel rendering and parallel visualization as a sorting problem. And in that regard, he formulated uh, three different algorithms, and those algorithms were called sort first, sort middle, and sort last. And depending on when in the rendering pipeline one would sort, we would use either of those three algorithms. And the taxonomy is uh, largely driven by the rasterization algorithm. We will learn why this is the case and how the taxonomy fits into uh, the rasterization algorithm. We will uh, learn that. So this taxonomy is actually very important when it comes to understanding GPU hardware design. It 
is a taxonomy that is uh, targeted towards distributed memory processing. So we're assuming that there is uh, some type of data distribution or some type of work item distribution in general. And as such, the taxonomy is also applicable to software rendering. Like the uh, initial objective of Molnar was to provide a taxonomy for the rasterization algorithm. And as such, is very important for uh, GPU vendors. And we will, uh, from that, we will also see um, how parallelism manifests in a typical uh, GPU rendering pipeline that implements the rasterization algorithm. And the taxonomy, nevertheless, is also very important for like rendering on a um, huge distributed memory system, like for instance on a supercomputer. And um, we will learn why this is the case. So, and before we more formally discuss. Molnar's sorting classification, let's first just gain an intuition. And the uh, sorting classification consists of two approaches or algorithms, and two of those are actually are quite intuitive. And therefore, we will first discuss those two approaches. And the very first approach that we will discuss is called sort first. So sort first sees us assigning screen space regions to processors. Uh, like in this case here, we have our screen and we have two processors, P1 and P2. And before we do anything else, we as assign regions of the screen to the two processors. For example, like this, like where processor um, P2 is responsible for every even row and processor P1 is responsible for every odd row. Or maybe like that where processor P1 and processor P2 are responsible for about equal shares of the screen. So it doesn't really matter how we distribute uh, the screen space regions among the processors. The only thing that is important is that there is no overlap. Yeah? Like that uh, we have a unique assignment of uh, screen space regions and of pixels to processors. So and then when we render an image, the very first thing that we do is we find out where the geometry that we're rendering would project to, like without even transforming it. Well, we don't even apply any transformations to the geometry, but we really just try to find out where the geometry would project to, like on a very high level. And then we assign the geometry to either of the two processors based on the screen space regions that the geometry overlaps. And therefore, the algorithm is called sort first, because we a priori sort the geometry to the two processors. Now, when the camera changes, for instance, that assignment will also change. So every time when we render a frame, we will sort the geometry uh, to the two processors. And the other algorithm that is of relevance to us is the so-called sort last algorithm. Like, this is my hand-drawn version of the teapot here, and I hope you forgive my uh, my bad hand drawing here. Um, nevertheless, this is this is a teapot, and I'm now distributing the teapot to two processors, right? I'm like splitting the teapot, like in the middle, like maybe with a KD tree, like with some sorts with some, with some means that helps me distribute the teapot to two processors, and then I'm assigning the geometry to the two processors and that assignment stays fixed. And based on that fixed assignment, I'm now rendering images. Like the processor P2 will render an image and this is the outcome. And then processor P1 will render an image or as a matter of fact, they'll usually do that in parallel. Like the images will then arrive and then in the end we have to, like you can already see, those images are allowed to overlap, right? So that means that in the, in the end, we have to make a decision which parts of the image are in front and which parts are in the back. Like we have to sort them in visibility order. And therefore the algorithm is called sort last because um, only after we rendered the whole geometry on all the processors, we end up with a bunch of intermediate images and then we sort those intermediate Im images into visibility order and then we're done. And this is the reason why this algorithm is called sort last. And you already saw that both algorithms are based on distributing the data to the processors. 
That is, um, we in both cases have data parallel algorithms. And you also see that the assignment of uh, work and of work items is different. We, in a little bit, will discuss the Molnar taxonomy a bit more formally. But uh, for our discussion, it is first important uh, to recall the algorithm rasterization. Because Molnar's original paper and Molnar's taxonomy actually focuses on rasterization. So and I therefore present you a very high level overview of the rasterization algorithm. Like this is motivated by the algorithm rasterization too. And it consists of four stages and the first stage I just called the vertex stage. And this is the stage where uh, the geometry is transformed and where primitive assembly happens. Like, and this stage is followed by the scan conversion stage. And the scan conversion stage receives us input, edge equations, and will then perform the Pineda algorithm. Like, it will take the edge equations and turn them into fragments. And those fragments are passed on to the fragment stage. And the fragment stage will light all the fragments, will perform shading operations on the fragments, and will presumably run fragment shaders, etc. And then uh, we'll pass the fragments to the so-called compositing stage. And the compositing stage is what was formerly known as the blending and as the depth buffer operation. So this is a very high-level overview of the algorithm rasterization, and we will adopt that high-level overview to understand the Molnar taxonomy. So when based on those prerequisites, it should now be possible to understand the Molnar taxonomy in its entirety. Like sort first, we already discussed, where we basically distribute untransformed primitives to processors. Like the sorting fa phase is pretty much the very first thing that we do. And this is followed by like the rasterization algorithm. Like we sort and then we perform the rasterization algorithm. And the sort is only precluded by something that I call pre-transform here and what Molnar also calls a pre-transform, which is a very simple basic step to find out where the geometry belongs to, like um, where in screen space the geometry would project to. Like the approaches that are used here are actually pretty simple. Like in fact, what people would usually do is they would, um, for instance, not um, pre-transform the whole geometry but the uh, whole geometry would, for instance, be organized in some sort of tree or like, uh, like on a uniform grid. And then we would like only project the, uh, the AAB beads uh, that belong to the grid cells or to the KD tree uh, leaf nodes uh, to, the, to, to screen space. And that would, uh, would help us find out, like, like with that we could very easily and very, um, very efficiently find out where the geometry projects to, and then we sort the geometry to the processors. And then we're, in regards to communication, we're done, right? Like what you can already see from the drawings is that Molnar's taxonomy is pretty much targeted towards how you would implement a, like, a, like the rasterization algorithm, presumably on a GPU. This will become more obvious when we discuss the next sorting approach, like the sort middle approach. But you can already see here that um, and this is like a this uh, illustration is actually um, uh, very much inspired by an illustration from Molnar's paper, and you can already see uh, that uh, this is very much targeted towards GPU architecture. So what we are talking here is the GPU as a distributed memory machine with uh, several processors uh, that have um, that uh, process a certain share of the memory. So, and the problem here really is that we have to redistribute the data all the time. Like, and in all likelihood, like the geometry that we're dealing with nowadays, at least, uh, can be pretty huge. Like we often have like millions of triangles. But when we're in a setting like where we have only very few geometry and like in the very early days of GPUs and of um, graphics programming, we usually had very little geometry. Uh, it could make very much sense to distribute the uh, geometry. And then there is also a, another thing that we can potentially make use of is so-called frame-to-frame coherence. 
Like, uh, it is true that the geometry assignment will change over time, like whenever we move the camera, the geometry will change, but it will um, change in a very coherent way. Like, once the geometry is uh, distributed and we move the camera only a little bit, then it's kind of likely that we don't have to distribute the geometry so much, but that the geometry is already where it belongs, because um, it uh, was there uh, during the last frame, and the um, the the new frame didn't change so much um, in regards to the data distribution. So this might actually not be so bad, but in general, uh, we have to deal with uh, distributing the memory all the time. So one thing to note is that people sometimes also um, refer to sort, sort first when uh, the data is not distributed, like when we're not in a distributed uh, memory scenario. Like for instance, in the ray tracing case we discussed before, where we parallelized over all the pixels, we kind of implied that the data is uh, either shared or that the data is replicated on all processors. So, and in certain, certain cases, um, the definition of, of uh, what uh, people call sort first is actually kind of sloppy. Like, um, people are like a bit sloppy about uh, how they define sort first. And you will also um, hear people call um, approaches sort first where the data is either replicated or where the data is shared. But according to Moner's um, original taxonomy, sort first implies that we redistribute the data and we do so before we do anything else. So when the uh, next algorithm in this uh, taxonomy is uh, sort middle, and sort middle basically sees us uh, distributing edge equations. Like we're in the, the scenario that we're in is the rasterization algorithm. And we're now in the middle of the rasterization algorithm, that is um, the vertex stage uh, we already ran, and we performed the viewforge uh, transforms. And the result of the viewforge transforms and of the primitive assembly phase that is uh, is edge equations, right? Like because we're having we're, we're using Pineda's algorithm, and those edge equations now are sorted, and the edge equations are projected to screen space in a very similar fashion that we earlier projected the uh, geometry to screen space. We're now projecting the edge equations to screen space, and that is we're sorting the edges in order, like the edge equations in order, and then each processor has its own share of the um, edge equations, and I mean, uh, let us let us just uh, give those processors a name. Let's call them raster engines. Yeah? And this is a, a, this is what uh, GPU vendors call them. Yeah? And those uh, processors are responsible for um, rendering uh, edge equations, and uh, they will output fragments. So the sort will happen right before the the scan conversion stage, um, and the edges will be sorted to the raster engines. Like, as a matter of fact, um, this is one way to implement a GPU architecture. And uh, those raster engines, well, they are also important even if we don't use sort middle. Uh, this is important to note. Like, raster engines uh, really only mean um, we have uh, processors that, um, that process edge equations. And here in this very case, the sorting step just happens right before we use the uh, raster engines. So this is basically sort middle. Like um, you can already see that the whole algorithm only makes sense when we're talking rasterization, right? Like for the um, sort middle approach, we could also imagine that we later render with a like a with a ray tracer. But here it's really about rasterization because we're talking scan conversion and we're uh, dealing with edge equations. So in the um, sort last approach, we already talked about. Uh, like we're doing all the rendering up front, and then we're We've rendered like um, a bunch of intermediate images, and then we're sorting them in order, and then we're compositing them. And as a matter of fact, here it doesn't really matter how we render. Like we could render with anything with a ray tracer. Yeah. So does it? That actually doesn't matter so much. And uh, for those reasons, like as with sort first and with sort last, it doesn't really matter so much how we render. Uh, those uh, two approaches are actually quite popular with uh, distributed memory visualization and rendering even outside the realm of rasterization. And in particular, sort last, we will later also discuss in the context of distributed memory computing on supercomputers and large uh, networks of rendering nodes. So with sort last, a couple of things are actually a bit more complicated when, than with, for example, with the sort first algorithm. 
like for instance compositing is a bit more complicated like we have to make sure that we are able to in the end sort our intermediate images into visibility order and like when we have opaque geometry this is usually rather simple because we just uh, can use the z buffer and this requires us to um, pass depth values along with the intermediate images and when we have like semi-transparent geometry, things are, are sometimes a bit more complicated as we have to perform alpha comp compositing, that is we have to uh, blend our pixels. And in certain cases, it might actually be hard to uh, supply depth values along with, the, with uh, potentially um, semi-transparent geometry. Like for instance, if there just is no depth value, like when we're not rendering our real surfaces, but like a volume or something like this, uh, then we might have to actually have to employ other means like for instance we might have to use a kd tree or something like this uh, to um to uh sort the uh intermediate images into visibility order and like there's another thing that's a bit more complicated with sort last parallel rendering and uh, that is load balancing like actually, like we already uh, said that with both approaches, with sort first and with sort last, we have a um, fixed assignment of work items to processors. Like with the sort first algorithm, we have a fixed assignment of screen space regions to processors. And that uh, doesn't change throughout the frame that we are rendering. Like in the next frame, it might change, but it won't change within a single frame. And with sort last, we have a fixed assignment of uh, geometry to uh, processors, and this assignment also doesn't change. Like usually, it doesn't even change um, across frames. Like you can distribute data in between, but you usually don't. Like in general, both approaches see us like having geometry distributed uh, to the processors, and um, Molnar's taxonomy, like in particular with sort first sees us uh, redistributing geometry all the time like and if we were to use the, the, the this type of algorithm like nowadays for in order to, to perform a scientific visualization of say a simulation then this is usually just not feasible like in like, like nowadays with typical visualization workloads one would like really never distribute geometry like it's usually just not a good idea to to distribute geometry because usually the geometry is just huge in in comparison to to the pixels that we're rendering. So and and obviously with sort last you can uh, get kind of a kind of kind of a load balancing problem. Like imagine uh, you have uh, this assignment here, and now you move the the head you move it up so that the upper half um, is outside the screen, right? So that means the processor that renders the upper half of the uh, of the of the head now doesn't have anything to do because we like we will we will call it very early on in the pipeline and we'll find out that we have nothing to do where the other processor does all the rendering for its uh, lower half. And then we obviously get a load imbalance because um, one processor idles while the other processor is busy, and those load balances we could actually only mitigate if we distributed memory like if a uh, distributed geometry like if we were to implement something like work stealing for instance and those load balancing approaches are actually much easier to implement with sort first uh, like for instance consider this assignment to four processors here like and you could very very well imagine that we move like uh, the whole scene to the left half of the screen and then those processors here would be would, would idle right they'd have an, no work to do and we have uh, the same problem that we had with the uh, sort last approach like in the, with a very simple static load balancing scheme like this one here we could mitigate the effect like with an with with a granularity of this here that we use for the for the uh, assignment of work items to processors we would basically never run into uh, into this uh, this load balancing problem because um, it's quite unlikely that the um, that the whole geometry just falls uh, within a single row, huh? like and um, therefore with sort first we're actually much more flexible. But on the other hand, um, sort first nowadays uh, is kind of infeasible uh, for a distributed memory uh, context. Like in a distributed memory context where we distribute the geometry, um, it's 
nowadays is really just not feasible to redistribute the data all the time. That is, um, people usually nowadays use sort first when the data can be replicated across the processors or when the data is shared, like as in, in real shared memory. Like as a matter of fact, sort first also allows us to implement those uh, nice um, uh, dynamic load balancing approaches here. Like for instance, uh, you would just subdivide the uh, screen space into tiles and then you would um, like not not in the very beginning um, do the assignment of process of processors to screen space regions, but you would rather put those screen space regions into a priority queue or into a queue in general, and the processors would just um, pull work from the queue, and that way you would achieve dynamic load balancing as on the processors that have much work to do would just would uh, process fewer tiles, and the processors that happen to just get the tiles where there is not so much work um, would be able to process more tiles. Uh, and this can actually also be combined with other um, like adaptive refinement approaches, etc. But the real shortcoming of the sort first algorithm like is really um, that it doesn't work very well with like when we were considering realistic workloads nowadays doesn't work very well when we want to distribute geometry across processors. Like when we're thinking of like a supercomputer where we're, we're visualizing a simulation result, for instance, uh, then sort first is usually not feasible unless we can uh, really replicate the data on all the nodes or have them in shared memory. Then sort first is actually a very good idea. Like like what we did with our ray tracer earlier, like with the with the widget ray tracing algorithm, for instance, where we assumed we, the data was replicated or shared. That really makes, makes sense. But uh, when we have to redistribute the data, then people usually nowadays use sort last. And therefore, we will in the next session uh, talk about a lot about sort last. Like with sort last, the uh, problem that we will run to actually will be that um, rendering will not be so much of a bottleneck, but actually sending intermediate images over the network will, will be a real bottleneck. And therefore, we will talk about clever ways to uh, distribute the intermediate images over the network um, without too much contention. And all that we will discuss in the next session.